Hi, this is Nicole Gabay, and today I was just wondering, like, what do you think of when you think of a classical music conductor? I mean, you know, of course, we all remember Bugs Bunny, remember? da na 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 da na 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 da na na da na na da na na da na na Okay, all right, and maybe you remember, I don't know, you've seen an image of a guy on a stage with a baton and he's doing a lot of this? Well, not so Jung Ho Pak. Wait till you see who we're going to talk to today. We're going to explore the life of the artistic director and principal conductor of the Cape Cod Symphony Orchestra and the Orchestra Nova in San Diego. And he's also the conductor at Interlochen. So I bring you Jung Ho Pak. a band showed me that actually music can have the purpose of connecting you with other people. Mm -hmm. And through these teachers who are very passionate about quality and about um, having fun, mm -hmm. because up to that point I never thought music could be fun, they really inspired me not only to possibly think about music as a profession, but also teaching too. Wow. So as it turned out, when I graduated from high school, yeah. I thought I was going to go out and do exactly what they did, which is basically be another Mr. Holland and teach in high school keep, keep and teaching. do that. Well, then if we could rewind for just a moment, mm -hmm. back to six years old. Right. What were your parents like? What was their influence to get you to sit down at the piano? How did that come about? It was a very traditionally kind of Asian American experience in the yeah. sense that they wanted me to play piano because they thought it'd be good for me. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a very strong belief in the Asian community and, and other immigrant families Definitely, as yeah. well yeah. that playing an instrument is important, developing the mind, absolutely, and uh, giving you discipline, making oh, yeah. you a, a broader individual to appreciate the arts. So I started piano because I wanted piano lessons. You did. Yes. You honestly said, Mom. I'm ready for piano lessons. Well, I didn't quite know what lessons were all about, but okay. I knew I wanted to play the piano. But at the point, I didn't realize what it would take to get there. Mm -hmm. And, and I were, learned... Were you six? I mean, this is what I've read, that I you was were around six, six years old? I was around six years old. But what I quickly learned is that I, along with many other kids, and this is how I know I'm not a prodigy, <laughs> I hated to practice. Do your parents play instruments? Well, my dad was an amateur musician. He played um, a little guitar, mm -hmm. knew how to read a little bit of piano. Mm -hmm. My mother, uh, not so much, no. but she enjoyed to sing a little bit here and there. Mm -hmm. But I would not say that my parents were professional musicians by any Anyways. stretch of the imag uh, imagination. Mm -hmm. My dad was a pharmacist and then a dentist. Uh -huh. My mother was a registered nurse. So fundamentally, we really, uh, I really had a very normal, average upbringing. Now, siblings? Uh, I have an older sister. Is she musical? N no, not really. <laughs> really? Not really. So isn't that interesting? So why did they sort of let her, you know, okay, you don't want to practice, that's okay. And then with you, they're like, oh, no. I don't think she really was drawn to music. Uh, in, so you were drawn to it? I think so, I, 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 early on. But there was a time where I actually gave it up for a while. And, you know, all of this trial and tribulation mm -hmm. of, of, you know, that music didn't come easily to me. Well, yeah, I was going to ask you, do you think, is it innate or is it a learned skill or? I would have to say that I believe that any person on the planet mm -hmm. can be a very good musician mm -hmm. if they're, if certain doors are unlocked for them, if they learn to appreciate the art of making music, the act of making music, mm -hmm. and, and in a way that, that they realize they can be human. Sometimes when we're young, mm -hmm. we, we play music out of a sense of duty, mm -hmm. and, and maybe a teacher doesn't tell you that the reason you should play music is to touch another person's heart. For me, because I, did, I wasn't naturally a, a, a fish to water in mm -hmm. terms of music, mm -hmm. I'm very proud about the way that I think about music now because for me, it's not connecting with the classical music connoisseur. Right. It's about connecting for the average person who doesn't yeah. necessarily understand Which it. Which is wonderful. I know you mentioned you had your Mr. Holland, your, you know, your inspiration, but that wasn't until junior high. So right. between age six and 12, this is when I find a lot of kids just drop it, give it up, can walk away. So what kept you interested? Uh, again, uh, joining a band for the very first time. When you got to junior high? When I got to junior high. Mm -hmm. And 
it, it gave me a sense of responsibility. I was right. fairly decent at the clarinet. Yeah. And so I, I was suddenly good at something mm -hmm. where you can measurably see that, yeah. you know, one, not only in terms of grade, but in terms of position in the, in the band, mm -hmm. that I, I felt a, a strong sense of self-worth. One of the most common questions I get mm -hmm. from parents mm -hmm. are that, how do I get my child to practice? Yeah. You know, how hard do I push? And one of the things I tell them is that, you know, don't push so hard that it actually breaks apart your relationship with parent and yeah. child. Right. Um, I remember a fair amount of screaming matches when I was a young kid. Really? Sure, and I think, I think that sort of helped me push me away from music, actually, yeah, because yeah. it was a confrontational issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's important that actually the child gets the kind of teacher mm -hmm. who really sparks the joy and the mm -hmm. love of playing the instrument. Playing. And if your child is not into, into playing music, you sh besides taking a look at your responsibility in mm -hmm. terms of supporting the child, mm -hmm. take a look at the teacher. Find right. out if the teacher is the right, the right match for your child. Just connecting child. with that exactly. child. Exactly. Right. Okay. So would you say that, um, you just mentioned that your mom would sit with you. She would literally sit at the piano with you while you practiced? Sometimes she would or she'd mm -hmm. be in the kitchen washing dishes and, and she'd hear me practice. Okay. and. And I remember sometimes I would make a mistake and I would say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. <laughs> and I'd go through it again, you know, and I'd say this like, you know, 20 times in a half right, an hour. Right. Playing with other people was really the answer for a lot of mm. my desire to play music. Okay. And did someone tell you, practice hard and you'll be famous? I, I didn't have someone like that, but I had a fantastic, I had two fantastic band teachers. Yeah. We're talking about yeah. the Mr. Holland. Yeah. Opus effect. Yeah. I had a fantastic junior high teacher named Ted Tannehill, mm -hmm. and then I had another great high school conductor for a few years. His name was Rocco Distasio. Oh, great! You know, name. old Italian conductor, yeah. uh, hardcore mm -hmm. boot camp type wow. of, 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 but he really insisted on excellence and mm -hmm. commitment. <laughs> risk, more abandon, more viciousness. If you've ever had a bad day, just take it out right here. <laughs> the payoff was in how well we sounded and, and played. Right. So at that point, I learned about the benefits of discipline and hard work. And how old were you at that point that you really had that connection like, hmm, this actually is good. I was a, I was a freshman in high school. And, and, and that young. made it. And then, from that, I actually got other opportunities. I, I tried out for the drum major position, didn't get it, but I was given the pep band, which in the end actually turned out to be a very good thing because I, I actually had to do some actual conducting That's at that That's when point. you started conducting. Yes. Right. So, all right, so your path started to sort of come together in a way. It's and you were true. young, and you were quite young for that. It, yes, I, I, again, I, I think I started <laughs> taking over the pep band even as, as, I think I was a junior in high school, but mm -hmm. the first time I started waving my hands in front of a group, was in junior high. So I got up in front of the group and I started leading them and it is perhaps the most dangerous drug out there conducting I've heard a group you of mention people that, that. But I don't know that all people would be affected as you are of that drug. It's such a uh, seductive experience to wave your arms in front of people and mm -hmm. have sound come back at you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's unlike anything uh, that you can experience, and mm -hmm. that's why a lot of people are drawn into it. And, and, and it's kind of unfortunate, really, because conducting is actually not necessarily about moving your hands. Mm -hmm. People think it is. Yeah. It's about communicating ideas, yes. having ideas.
your sense of confidence, your bravado with this, with just following through on this passion? Oh, well, <laughs> you have to be a little insane, and you have to have well, a healthy... artists are, in a way. Yes, yes <laughs> yeah. we all are. Yes. Uh, and you have to have a very healthy ego. So does your wife play? You said she participates with your daughter. She's she's an amazing person. She she not only plays clarinet professionally and oh, well, wow. but she also is a trained actress. She went to oh, to, wow. to uh, the Academy of Dramatic Arts in Pasadena, uh -huh. and she also is a fabulous cook. Oh. And uh, <laughs> she's also a professional photographer. Wow! So <laughs> so creativity abounds. Exactly. How wonderful! What a great environment for your daughter to just kind of flourish and try things and. A amen. And yeah. A absolutely. So do you guys ever have like family night and you're at home and everyone's playing their instrument and doing their thing and... No, it's not quite no. like the Von Trapp family. <laughs> when I'm home uh, or on the road or, or in the car, mm -hmm. I'm rarely listening to classical music. Ah. I'm listening to everything from pop music to jazz to, um, you know, world music or yeah. something experimental or, or country music or whatever. Really? I, I truly have a humongous palette mm -hmm. for diversity. What was it like when you visited Korea? Well, when I first went back to Korea after having been there when I was a little boy, uh -huh. but being back as, as an adult was very much like an Alex Haley Roots experience mm -hmm. where I, it was odd getting off the plane and seeing all these people who were Korean mm -hmm. and Asian looking. When I conduct a uh, Korean orchestra, yeah. That's also a very unique experience of conducting a group of a certain ethnicity. Jung Ho, thank you for suggesting this today. Oh, it's one of my favorite places. Well, we are really excited to try this. All right, so let's uh, get our appetites going. Classical music is not about me mm -hmm. or even about Mozart and Beethoven. Mm -hmm. It's about imbuing society with a stronger sense of um, dignity, mm -hmm. beauty, mm -hmm. um, nobility, intelligence. Elevating. Elevating yeah. society in a, in a time where there's just so much junk food out yeah. there. Not food that's carefully prepared. Like this gorgeous food. Like this gorgeous it's food. Totally fresh, yeah. And, and also like this plate, I believe that classical music serves a purpose in a very full diet. Uh-huh. Listen, I, I, I do watch MTV. I was watching uh, Black Eyed Peas this morning on, oh. on, on a music video. How about that? And, you know, whether you like country music and whether you like rock and roll or whether you like hip hop or yeah. whether you like big band. Yeah. Classical music can fit on there as well. Right. I think where classical music got in trouble mm -hmm. was when it was treating itself as the be-all and end-all. Mm -hmm. And what you do is you create a sense of snobbery mm -hmm. that pushes the rest of the society away. Mm -hmm. And someone like Leonard Bernstein, mm -hmm. who's fabulous ar ar at articulating how classical music is just like any other music. Right. He would sit down at the piano and play Elvis Presley or the Beatles yeah. Yeah. and just say, this is how Tchaikovsky is like that yeah. as well. So. I'm trying to be that same kind of conductor of presenting classical music in a way that people can easily digest. It's a little more approachable. Approachable, but still with great care and great fidelity to the music and to the quality of the performance. Somewhere along the way, there must have been a germ of the idea for you, I'm thinking that would make it okay for you to do it differently and to pursue that avenue, pursue that path. Right. And and to dedicate 90% of your time to the administrative work mm -hmm. and 10% mm -hmm. to the music. And the fundraising is 90% of your work and the market research, the stats, the business side of things. So I'm curious, where does that come from for you, that desire? to stick with this unusual model? That's a great question. And I have to back up a little bit. Yeah. I, I was on many different faculties at different universities. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on faculty at UC Berkeley. Uh -huh. And San Diego Symphony called me up and said, would you like to audition for the assistant conductor position? Now, I was a professor at a major university, yep. but there was something inside of me that wanted to do more than just be trapped in academe. Mm -hmm. I, I should say trapped in academe, because yeah. you know I, I love teaching very much. Mm -hmm. But what I meant was is that 
I felt that their interest was not in the, what, how the larger society was perceiving classical music, mm -hmm. but just how the students were. So I jumped out of the uh, fire into the frying pan Got it. and took, took that leap and cut of, cut of pay, cut of authority, mm -hmm. and went to this wonderful orchestra, but within a year it yeah. went bankrupt. Um. And so, I mean, luckily I was not music director. I wasn't, you know, the top banana. Yeah. But what I did learn was that classical music could die even in a wealthy city like mm -hmm. San Diego, mm -hmm. in, a, in a very connected, intelligent city like San Diego. Mm -hmm. And if it could die there, it could die anywhere. Mm -hmm. So this started me on this journey of trying to find out why is classical music so disconnected from the consciousness of Americans yeah. and the world in general. Yeah. This is happening in uh, Europe as well. Really? Yeah. Yes. And so I decided that A, the arts, the performing arts, mm -hmm. did not take the sense of responsibility of running itself like a business. Yeah. Now, we as artists tend to treat ourselves as being elite, as being somehow separate from the responsibility and the onus mm -hmm. of balancing your books. Right, which you have to know both. Absolutely. And what I learned by mm -hmm. the bankruptcy is that despite all of the quality that was on stage and all of the good intentions mm -hmm. of both the people on the stage and in the office and the board, yeah. Yeah. It could not save this organization. Mm -hmm. You had to ultimately face the consumer. Yeah. Now, no one wants to think of their audience, especially classical audience, right, as, as being consumers. consumers. Yeah. But they are. Right. They're spending money on the ticket and the night out and everything. Bingo. That's yeah. exactly right. So it started me on this journey of taking a look at other successful businesses. Apple Computer, Southwest Airlines, Ben and & Jerry's, and Martha Stewart. And seeing how America was changing its tastes mm -hmm. and how the new entrepreneur was meeting those tastes. Uh, Martha Stewart's a great example. Yeah, amazing. She, she takes uh, home decoration, cooking, mm -hmm. uh, home, uh, what, what used to be called a homemaker, yes. and turned it into a fine art. Right. And America was ready to receive that. Mm -hmm. So I think now Americans are also ready to receive beautiful music as, this, as if they want to decorate their lives. Beautiful mm -hmm. cars, beautiful clothes, beautiful mm -hmm. food, beautiful homes. Now they're able to receive beautiful art yes. into their lives, yeah. but it needs to be presented in a way that, in a language that they can understand without right. the pre presupposition that they went to uh, university and took Music 101, right. or that their CD collection is yay yeah. high, yeah. but rather who they are. Yes. That's so interesting. Now, did you have a, a, do you have an MBA? I mean, do you have a business background? I don't, but I like it's, it's, I like to describe myself yeah. as being a businessman who happens to be a conductor. I've heard people <coughs> say that, successful artists say that. I'm a really good business person, I just happen to be an artist. Oh, really? I've heard people <sighs> say that. And, and I think that that's the difference between the conductor who mm -hmm. is sitting in his apartment mm -hmm. wishing he was conducting right. and someone who has certain longevity. Yeah. Because I, I believe that the customer is always right. Mm -hmm. The customer is always right in terms of their experience. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, when, you know, so often I have someone come up to me and say, you know, I just don't know much about classical music, but I really like that concert. Right. Or I didn't like that concert. Yeah. Uh, if I didn't like the concert, then something's wrong with me. And I look at them and I go, absolutely not. Mm. If you've never had sushi before yeah. and you don't like it, it's not good. Right. You know, you don't have to have someone tell you if a glass of wine makes makes sense or yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So, so, you know, if you if you address it from if you make every decision mm -hmm. from the ticket buying experience to the web page yeah. to what it's like to park your car to how does the music sound and yeah. how do the musicians look and etc. And if you walk out of that concert thrilled, then you've met the consumer's need. Right. So you really are a businessman. I mean that's a very not only entrepreneurial way of thinking, but that's, that is a more global context for what you're doing. I, I, I do it with great pride, and I'll tell you yeah. why. There's two reasons why. One is that this business that I'm in yeah. with the Cape Cod Symphony Orchestra has employees yeah. who feed their families, right. pay their rent, send their kids to college. Right. They're lively, and the musicians also. Right. So I, I take my responsibility to be able to provide for them right. very seriously. Yes. The second reason is mm -hmm. that I'm providing sustenance, spiritual sustenance for the community. Mm -hmm. If if we ever go under, who's going to provide that for them? Right. So. So that's where the passion comes from. That's that's interesting because it's also in a way kind of innate. I mean, it seems some people have 
you know, a predisposition to be able to understand that and to embrace that. And that's, that's fascinating. It's, I think it is, it's really. A, it's a fantastic uh, responsibility and privilege yeah, yeah. to have such purpose in your life. Absolutely, absolutely. That's awesome. So what are some of your musical goals now? Well, with the Cape Cod Symphony Orchestra, yeah. my goal is to make sure that everyone on the Cape, from Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket to Falmouth yep. to Provincetown, yep. everyone knows that this orchestra is for them yep. and that we play music specifically for them. Yep. And that means that you have to show you care right. more than just giving concerts. It means uh, getting into the classroom, mm -hmm. working with the teachers and the students. Yes. Um, and getting to know the communities. Mm -hmm. I speak to different groups all over yeah. the Cape. And it means um, programming in a way that makes them feel a sense of pride. Yeah. For example, we just did a Christmas concert mm -hmm. with lots of Cape connections, the Chatham Corral, for example. And, and, and next year, we're, um, uh, oh, and, and, and two uh, Broadway soloists who uh, have roots on the Cape as well. Mm -hmm. So. If, if they feel like this is their orchestra and, the, and these are people who live in their community and this is a conductor who cares about them, yeah. then it's not like this is a hired gun, oh, this orchestra could care less about me, but rather this is my home team. Right, it's part of a community. This is my Red Sox. Yeah, exactly. That's great. I mean, that's. I think that that message is starting to permeate. I think little by little, and of course it starts as a grassroots effort and, you know, very, it has to start somewhere. So Word of mouth there. is the best advertisement. Absolutely. It's also the cheapest, too. Yeah, well, that's true, so, too. <laughs> so that's why you should always please your customer. Absolutely. And, yeah, no, I think that's that's a wonderful way to look at it because yeah. I think people will feel that. They will know that. Yes, They, yes, they yes. will know that. Um, Absolutely. So by now I've also watched a lot of videos of interviews that you've done and speaking engagements, um, and I've even watched a rehearsal here. Right. And I've noticed the way that you talk to each individual musician is so fluid mm -hmm. and and just so specific. And I was wondering, have you actually played all the instruments in an orchestra? I haven't. And I think that's one of the great um, misunderstandings that a conductor plays every instrument well. Mm -hmm. um, I've fiddled around on the various instruments, yeah. but I have not mastered all the instruments. Mm -hmm. I leave that to my colleagues, and if you're working with very qualified musicians, then right. you really can trust them, and there's that trust there as well. Yeah. So when I speak to a musician, yeah. it's not like I'm, in, I'm their employer, but, but the truth is, is they have more power than I do, mm. because they're making the sound, right. and I'm not. Right. So what I try to do is make them, when I speak to them, yeah. treat them not only as a, as, a, as a colleague, but as a great master yeah. of their instrument. Yeah. And I think that they rise to the challenge if you expect that of them. Letter B, okay? Very good rhythm, French horns, bassoons, and low strings, okay? Exactly. Okay. elicit the specific thing it seems you're looking for, which is why I thought, oh, well, you must have played all these instruments to know that that instrument can do that. Well, uh, there's enough instinctive after many years of conducting yeah. that you know basically what the limitations are mm -hmm. as well as the potential. Mm -hmm. But I, when I do speak to the musicians, I do try to talk with as much as I can with my hands. Yeah. Because just like anybody who doesn't want to be talked at all the time, um, a, a, an orchestra that's very responsive to a conductor's gesture mm -hmm. finds it much more enjoyable mm -hmm. than to hear someone gab on why they want a certain things. So yeah. I, I try to try to balance, balance that. Yeah, no, it's spectacular. I mean, it's incredibly inspiring to watch you conduct and and rehearse with the with the performers. I find rehearsals much more interesting than concerts. I have too. to say, I loved it. I mean, it was so interesting. It's I like loved walking it. into the kitchen and exactly. seeing exactly what's how the back it's made. of the house. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Leading an orchestra demands a lot of chutzpah. Yeah. <laughs> to get up in front of that many musicians who yeah. have, in many cases, more experience doing what they're doing than what you've done. Yeah. And leading them to a great work of art that right. they may have played, you know, a dozen times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have to have incredible amount of confidence. Absolutely, and yeah. authority. Yep. And say it with such specificity. Yeah. And immediacy, not to waste any time. Right. Because when you're in rehearsal, they're your audience. 
-hmm. you, you think that the audience isn't there mm -hmm. in rehearsal? Mm -hmm. That's not true. Uh -huh. The orchestra is your audience. Right. And you can tell when someone's slowly looking at their watch, <laughs> seeing how things are going, or you know, someone who's right. disconnected. Right. And so you, like a comedian who's working the room, yeah, yeah. a conductor also has to make sure everyone's engaged. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. That's amazing. It's, and it, that's the thing where you said it's actually quite simple to <laughs> conduct. But this is, this is what inspires the movement, and that's what we see, which is clearly, you know, a very practiced, you know, and thought out process. Um, all right, so now another thing I notice as a conductor, a huge physical movement. I mean, I definitely know I saw you completely airborne <laughs> at some point <laughs> or another. So I'm thinking you obviously have to have tremendous physical stamina. Do you work out? How do you stay in shape? Running from plane to plane in the airport. Yeah. Well, that's it. That's all you have to do. Come well, on, you try know, to win I, that. I fool myself thinking that I get enough exercise on the podium. Yeah. Wow. All right. So no like hours at the gym every day and pumping iron and all this other stuff. I should. <laughs> I. I should. God. No fair. <laughs> all right. Um, okay, another thing I heard you say was that your goal was to break free of the seriousness that, um, that you mm. often encounter at concerts. Yeah. So what gave you that desire to kind of go that route? Well, one of the things that struck me was that 90% of classical music yeah. is happy. Varying degrees of Upbeat, happy. Yeah. It could be ecstatic, uh -huh. it could be warm and yeah. fuzzy, it could be laughing and joyous yeah. and music can be serious and mm -hmm. music can be very sad mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. or contemplative mm -hmm. but basically it's a positive feeling right. and I was struck by watching other orchestras mm -hmm. and some of my uh, previous orchestras mm -hmm. on how serious everyone looked mm -hmm. Almost, I, as I joke sometimes, it's like a, going to an undertaker's convention. Oh my goodness. Very, I mean, you, you have all the tuxedos and right. all the seriousness. Right. And, and I couldn't figure out why, and not only everyone, uh, no one was having fun, yeah. but I couldn't figure out why they weren't being touched by the music. Mm. It, it, we are actors on stage, sure. even though I think musicians don't want to think of themselves as actors. Oh, yeah. It's like somehow that's a but bad thing. They're performing. But they're performing. Yeah. The audience gets it. You get it. Oh yeah. But somehow we as classical musicians, when we're trained, don't or aren't ever told that or ever right. ever. They're not aware of that. Aware maybe. of that. Yeah. That, that, and that's a, a truth. Mm -hmm. So, I try to um, get the musicians to feel very risky mm -hmm. on stage yes. and in rehearsal. And the way I do that is by conducting in a very risky way. If it doesn't have this emotional sense of urgency, we are kind of destroying uh, the uh, intent of it. was inspired a little bit by Leonard Bernstein, uh, who would conduct with complete abandon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he didn't. He would wring the life out of a yeah, person, yeah. Uh, out of an orchestra, to get what he wanted. Right. Now he did that during the 1950s and 60s, mm -hmm. uh, at a time, well, and up through the rest of his career, at a time where conductors didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Conductors were the maestro and very right. serious, and right. sometimes very economical and very precise yeah. and. No emotion. No emotion. <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. let the music speak for itself. Right. But as we were talking about, there's a disconnect from mm -hmm. today's audience speaking the classical language. Right. So there has to be a translator on stage. Right. And that's why people love Yo-Yo Ma. Yes. Because he's so joyous right. when he's playing it's the cello. Fun. Exactly. It's fun. Yeah. And that translator makes the music seem more logical. And then people right. can come to the music. Right. So that's part of the reason why I conduct with such enthusiasm for both the musicians and the audience. Not yes. just for the audience. I don't well, try to show off. that's interesting. I mean, because now I kind of thought when you made that comment that you wanted to take the seriousness out, I thought you meant for the audience, but you really mean for the performers as well. Primarily for the performers. Yeah. And the audience are, are just a byproduct. They're going to respond. They, exactly. Right. They enjoy it as well. But I, but I don't conduct with effusive emotion mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes over the top you expression. Don't? You do. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I, I, don't, I don't do it 
for the audience. I understand. I it's do it for the musicians. It's completely natural. Yeah, to, to, yeah. To, and, and I think the music demands it. When you yes. conduct Tchaikovsky, he's, he's mm. ripping his heart out. Yeah. And how can you not reciprocate? Suck me in the stomach with those accents. <laughs> public school system. I know that that was your big turning point for mm. you and and the opportunities that you had and the exposure. You know, how how do you think that is today? How how do the public schools fare? Well, I, I think it's always a battle yeah. to make the arts an integral part of a well-rounded education. Mm -hmm. People think of just math and science as mm -hmm. as the, the the things that the only thing a child needs mm -hmm. in order to be successful in life. But we are seeing actually that there's a real push by companies searching for people who have a liberal arts education. Yes, the math and science are important, mm -hmm. but creativity in some ways is even more important. Yeah. And we're noticing that there's also a big push by the, the president's administration and education um, boards across the United States that start people are starting to realize that the natural resource is actually in people's Americans' creativity. Yeah, always has been if it you really has. think about I it. I know it got obscured for a while, and it, now I think yes. we're trying to go back to that. Yes, you know, I, I I think there's a sense of panic. Oh, we need to compete with the you yeah. know the the Indian community, or we have to com compete with the Chinese, and mm -hmm. you know, in terms of this kind of uh, brain power. Yeah, but being inspired, being creative. You can't underestimate that. Absolutely. I don't believe that every person needs to grow up and be a professional conductor. Yeah. But I think every child deserves the opportunity to experience the joy of music making. Yeah. And without that, it's like live, growing up in a building that has no windows. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's a big, it's a tremendous void if you don't have that musical background and exposure. And some people may not even realize it, but I think you're right. It does feed creativity. It does lend itself to other areas of creativity. I'm very proud of the fact that I was not a wunderkind and that I was not a, a prodigy yeah. I'm, and, and because I really had to come to music th through my own terms yeah. and through hard work. Mm -hmm. I started on piano and I had some wonderful teachers but to be quite honest I wasn't drawn to the piano. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't like practicing by myself while the other mm -hmm. kids are out playing baseball. Right. So I actually gave up music for a while but came back to it through the, again the public school systems uh -huh. of, of them teaching recorder and then clarinet. Yeah. So. For me, uh, and, th and then I decided to go into music for all the wrong reasons. I went into music because I didn't enjoy math and science. Mm -hmm. I didn't enjoy the academic classes. Yeah. So I said, okay, well, I'll be a musician. But becoming a musician out of default is... Mm. Not the right reason. <laughs> not the right, <laughs> right reason. It won't keep you going in 10 years. It, no, no, it won't sustain you. Right. So what happened in college is I had an epiphany. Mm. Uh, yeah. Some special moments of listening to music that was just gorgeously played, and I realized that music was more than just for me to fulfill my own enjoyment, yeah. self-serving, mm -hmm. but rather music could be yeah. there to heal people, to, right. to make people feel wonderful. Absolutely. I mean, that was an, an incredible epiphany. Yeah. And then learning about other kinds of music, like jazz, mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. learned about Miles Davis and, mm. and Oscar Peterson and the whole world of jazz, I realized that music could be very joyous and spontaneous. I wanted to see if I can make classical music, which is basically on a piece of paper, mm -hmm. feel as spontaneous and as improvised. I'm fascinated. What draws people to 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 things? To what, something, to, to anything. Something. Yeah. Right. Right. And 
and, and I've been incorporating that my entire artistic life mm -hmm. to see how to apply that to the great arts. I know you're quite a visionary in what you're doing. Now, where do you see the future of classical music going? I believe the, the future of classical music is going to go uh, in two ways. Mm -hmm. One is I think you're going to see the decline of the traditional model of mm. the orchestra mm -hmm. in, as it exists in some uh, very old models, mm -hmm. meaning that you have um, uh, a very expensive, a very heavily um, financed infrastructure. And you're going to start to see uh, like, like corporations sort of whittling away and you're going to see the advent of the individual mm. uh, small business owner, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so what you're going to see is the orchestras that are able to be more nimble, more maneuverable, and work with the musicians in a way that will allow them to get their media out more mm -hmm. on television, on the internet. Right. Those orchestras will survive mm -hmm. and actually flourish. Mm -hmm. But the orchestras and where there's conservative thinking that you know uh, we're really for another generation of the past, mm -hmm. uh, those orchestras will either uh, die, mm -hmm. well, they actually are dying, yeah, actually, right. or um, they'll have to have uh, a, a death and a resurrection. Mm -hmm. The musicians themselves who play in an orchestra mm -hmm. and the conductor and the administration and board mm -hmm. need to see it as a co-investment. I see. That, that everyone mm -hmm. is invested, either right. financially, uh, spiritually, mm -hmm. uh, professionally. Mm -hmm. And because in, in the traditional model, mm -hmm. Nicole, these elements are factionalized. I see. It's union, management, right. donors. Not my job, I don't do that. Right, 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 right. You take care of this. Yeah. And, and, and not everyone feels co-invested. Right. What's best for the entire organization? Right. Can we move together in sync yeah. instead of having to fight our way yeah. to, to there? Gotcha. And so it's kind of like an old business model from maybe the 1920s. Yeah. But really what we need is a more open type of management, kind of mm -hmm. similar to maybe what Apple Computer was in right. the 1980s or that we see in, in some of the uh, airlines. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, a, a little bit more flexible model. Interesting. That is interesting. Now, you often, I, like you mentioned, in, for the airlines, and there are some companies in which the employees invest in the company. Mm -hmm. So financially, like you said, that's an I, interesting, I, interesting avenue. Yes, I, it, it is because it 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 presupposes that an arts organization can be a for-profit business, right? In, in a way. Yeah. Now, instead of necessarily having shares and dividends. Yeah one can think of it in terms of the future and investing in the longevity of the organization. Right, right. Um, because that's what it's all about. Right, so it's not just point. monetary, it's the whole entire structure continuing exactly, on. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, awesome. and, and instead of, you know, just t t mine now. Right, right. This is what I do. I play my instrument and that's all. <laughs> Sometimes I, I see, you know, see these people who, who, who surround a nonprofit organization uh, or you know maybe it's just life and human nature in general, but it's kind of like those seagulls from Finding Nemo. Mine, 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 <laughs> mine, mine. You yeah. know, and you just need to open your eyes up and realize right, uh, no. we're all in this together. This is why I'm here. Mm -hmm. When I came and touched down on the Cape and, and worked with this orchestra and met the musicians and met the board members and met the staff, yeah. I had a sense that this orchestra was different. Mm. It didn't have the same kind of of staid thinking. It actually had ambition. Which is huh. rare, you know. Yeah. It, it's it, they wanted something extraordinary. Yes. And it was it was set down in very firm foundation thanks to Royston Nash, who's my predecessor. Yeah. But they, I really sensed that they wanted to do something extraordinary. So it's been a real big love affair for me. Right, for both on both sides, clearly. It, it, yeah. It has, and, yeah. and and the proof in the pudding is not just our enjoyment of working together, but it's in the How ticket much sales. It's grown. Yes, exactly. exactly. It's exponentially. I mean, since you're involved. We've, which has been huge. Our, our Christmas Pops has grown from three to five concerts. We've doubled our education concerts. We added a New Year's Day concert. Wow. Um, you know, we just, and we're selling out all of our concerts that's too, which awesome. is unheard of yeah. in this economy. Yeah, and you know, I think also that speaks to Cape Cod in general. I yes. think this is a place that encourages and attracts all manner of culture and like you said that has ambition it can't be just the same old same old here people want fresh ideas yes. people want new here it's interesting you know you think oh Cape Cod retirement community everyone's just kind of dwindling away but it's the opposite 
they're looking for more interesting. You're a hundred percent right. The, the definition of a retiree has changed so much yes. over the last 30, 40 oh, years. Totally. People are living longer, but they're also living younger, if yeah. you will. Yep. People in their 60s and 70s, I mean, they're really at the rock and roll generation yeah. and the television That's generation. That's true. That's right. They're it's not, in them. They have it in them to keep on blossoming and, and, and learning and, yep. and, 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 yep. and being active. And, and you bring up another important element that that really is the key to our success is the cape yeah because people have really embraced this orchestra in a way that I rarely see in America uh, sometimes in the larger communities there's a, a feeling like oh there's that big orchestra there on the hill yeah but here I really feel that people take a sense of pride and yes. a sense of interest in this orchestra I think so yes Jung Ho thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity Nicole. to just find out all this wonderful stuff about you well thank it's you been it's been a real privilege to be thank able to you. share it with you too oh, and have a great you. meal together too oh my gosh that was spectacular <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you You're and welcome. thank you for joining us